Okay, here we go. Let's uh, continue on from yesterday. We got a lot of material to cover. We are moving on, and of course, I'm not going to be put in the same company as Augie Richards as far as spelling goes. Therefore, we are changing out these uh, ID sheets to what to be spelled correctly. I still am blaming spell check, which Augie did not use. Okay, I switched computers for my last paragraph, and it wasn't turned on on that microsoft word. Okay. So the last paragraph is Whatever makes you feel better about it. I blame my own I really feel good if you feel good. That's my motto. Yeah. Yeah, but yours was Okay, well, that's only the two I caught. Okay, we're going to move, gang, to... No, we're still on the 22nd, got a ways to go. So, the last thing I told you is the fact that the police department had a ton of evidence against Oswald, but not in the killing of the president, but in the killing of J.D. Tippett. Okay? Now remember, if I kind of back you up, FBI agent James Hosty was getting frustrated, and so he asked Captain Fritz to ask Oswald, girls, he asked Captain Fritz to ask Oswald if Oswald had ever been to Mexico City. And when Fritz repeated that to Oswald, he stated he had been to Mexico while in the Marines. And Hosty got a little upset and he clarified, no, I meant Mexico City, not Mexico. And Oswald's reply was, what makes you think I've been to Mexico City? I've never been there. Now, Hosty knows he's lying because he read their letter, so now he's going to press him harder. But what happens when he goes to press him harder, Blake? Uh, uh, police guy shows up and says they're ready for the first lineup. They're ready for the first lineup. And again, the lineup is when they bring in three or four people along with the accused and witnesses point out who they saw, who did what. So here's what happened in the first lineup. Are they, the lineup are the people supposed to look like Lee Harvey Oswald? They, they try to make some comparisons. And Usually they, they use prisoners. Oh, Usually they oh. get prisoners of the same height and weight okay. and bring them in. Are well, they they use, like, if the person, if the witness hasn't been like, in the police station, They've done that, and that's to keep that in mind, because that's what they do here. Okay, now here's something interesting, though. Before Oswald was brought up for that first lineup, they searched him for the first time. He had never been searched prior to that. Remember, they took his wallet that had those IDs and stuff in it, but they searched him for the first time. They made a little error. You learn something every day. Oswald did not leave his wallet at Ruth Payne's house. He only left his 170 in cash and his wedding ring, which we'll talk about. So he did have his wallet with him. This is what they found on Oswald. This is what they found on him when they searched him just before the first lineup. Some of it you know. What? Wallet. And? $13.87. $13 they also found his Marine Corps ring. He had a ring from the Marine Corps. They found that on him his Marine Corps ring. They also found five live rounds of 38 caliber ammunition in his left trouser pocket. So the ammunition that was used in killing Tippett, he had five live rounds in his left trouser pocket. So they not only found $13.87 in cash, they found his Marine Corps ring and they found five live rounds of 38 caliber ammunition in his left trouser pocket. The fourth thing they found was the most interesting and it'll make sense later. They found a bus transfer. What is a bus transfer? It's when you get on a bus and then you can get off and transfer on to another bus. Now this bus transfer had not been used, keep that in mind, so they found a bus transfer that had not been used, 
$13.87 in cash, his Marine Corps ring, and five live rounds of 38 caliber ammunition, and that was found in his left pocket. Now, getting into what Kylie said, when Oswald was escorted to the first official lineup, he was brought in with three other individuals, so there was four total. And for his safety, because they didn't trust the prisoners, as Kylie said, they actually brought in police officers, not obviously dressed in their police gear, but they used three police officers, and Oswald was given, was placed in the number two position. So if Jacob was trying to identify first person number one, Oswald two, next person three, next person four in the lineup. Now does anybody want to guess who they have? Maybe I told you yesterday, I can't remember, but they have looking at the lineup to identify. Helen, Helen, Helen Markham. She is out there looking, and she's scared to death because she thinks that these people can see her. And what they did in those days, they didn't have a glass, you know, mere glass. They had bright lights that were flashing into the people's eyes that were being identified to the point where they could not see the people identifying them. But she didn't know that. She had to be assured that they could not see her because she was scared to death. Now when they walked people in, as soon as she saw Oswald walk in, she started to cry. The minute or second that Oswald walked in, she started to cry. Helen Markham started to cry. And when asked, she said there was no doubt in her mind that man number two was the man who shot and killed Officer Tippett. So she ID'd him just like this. Matter of fact, she started crying when he walked into the lineup room that she was that upset. So, lineup number one is done. Helen Markham was the person identifying. She identified Oswald like this. No doubt in her mind that she was, that he was the one that shot Officer Tippett. Okay? So, we move on to 4.50 p.m. 4.50 p.m. on the 22nd. Now, Captain Fritz knows Oswald is in custody because he's interrogating. He also knows that his wife lives where? Ruth Payne's house. At Ruth Payne's house in Irving. So what do you think the next step? What's Fritz going to do now? He's going to go send police officers to Irving, to Ruth Payne's house, to look for what? A rifle. Okay? If they find a rifle there, is that good or bad for Oswald? Bad. Good. Wait, wait. It's good, because the rifle's in, in evidence. So they, he's, what Fritz does is he orders police officers... That could be bad, too, though, because he said he'd never owned one. Well, yeah. probably, but it would have been better than if the one he had they had in custody. So police were sent out to Ruth Payne's house in Irving to look for a rifle. Well, they get there, and they ask Marina if Lee owned a rifle. And again, Marina doesn't speak English very well, so Ruth Payne does a lot of the, the interpreting here. And she acknowledged that Lee did own a rifle, and it was out in the garage wrapped in a blanket. So again, police go to Ruth Payne's house. They ask Mrs. Oswald, Marina Oswald, through Ruth Payne's interpretation, does your husband own a rifle? Yes. It's out in the garage wrapped in a blanket. So when police, Marina, and Mrs. Payne go out to the garage, there is a blanket on the floor of the garage. And Marina breathes a deep sigh of relief until the police officer bends down and lifts up the blanket and it goes limp over his arm, which means there is no gun in there. So this is the first time that Marina thinks to herself, maybe my husband is involved. Okay? So again, police go out to the garage, the blanket's laying on the floor, wrapped up as if there was a weapon in it. However, when the police officer bent down and lifted the blanket up, it just went limp over his arms. Obviously, no, no rifle in it. So, they know Oswald does not have a rifle there. So now they need to connect the rifle they have with Oswald. That's what they need to do. So the rifle that they found on the sixth floor of the depository, they need now to tie to Oswald and say that's his rifle. The missing rifle at Ruth Payne's in their mind, is the rifle they have in custody that they found on the sixth floor. So, at 5.45 p.m., 
Captain Fritz tells the police to go get both Marina and Mrs. Payne and bring them back to police headquarters for questioning. So at 545, Captain Fritz orders officers to go back out to Irvin, Irving and get Marina and Mrs. Payne and bring them back for questioning. Was Irving far away? Like, was there, was it's a there suburb. It was a few oh, miles off. It's a suburb. Yeah. It's, it's a suburb of Dallas, just like Oak Cliff was. Yep. Now, what do you want? What does Fritz want Marina to do? What's he hoping she does? Identify, good Zach, identify the rifle that they have in custody as the one that belonged to her husband. So that's what he's especially interested to see is if Marina could identify the rifle found in the depository. So the police go to Irving, they grab the two ladies, and just before they get ready to leave or depart, a neighbor of Ruth Payne's by the name of Lenny Mae Randall comes over and tells the police some information. So just before the police are about to depart from Ruth Payne's house back to Dallas Police Headquarters, one of Payne's neighbors, Lenny May Randall, it's on your ID sheet, came over to the police and gave him some information. And what Lenny May Randall told the police was that her brother had taken Oswald to work that day. And that when she went out to say goodbye, supposedly, she noticed that Oswald placed a package, a long package that was wrapped in brown paper in the back seat of the car. And she said it was about two feet long at the time. So Lenny May Randall comes down to the police and says, hey, my brother gave Lee Harvey Oswald a ride to work this morning, and I noticed that he put a package wrapped in brown paper in the back seat of the car, and they asked her, well, how, they asked her how long was it? She said, about two feet. <laughs> while, th while this is happening... Oswald's marched out for the second lineup. We got another lineup. And Oswald has been marched out again to another lineup. So back at police headquarters, while the police are picking up Ruth Payne and Marina to bring him back for questioning, Oswald is taken out for a second lineup. In this lineup, were people that were, remember I said there were several witnesses that saw Oswald shoot Tippett in that area? They had brought in several of those witnesses and brought Oswald out, and again, he was the one ID just like that. So this is the second lineup, so four guys, four different people, and he was identified, he wasn't put in the same position. He was identified again without question. So this is the second time they brought in a lineup, and the second time the people on the other side identified without question said that's the guy that shot Officer Tippett. At 7.15 p.m. on the 22nd, Marina Oswald arrives at police headquarters. Now, the third floor of the municipal building has been just packed with hundreds of reporters the entire time. It's just an, a nightmare to get by. I think you've seen a little bit of video on some of the things we've shown you. The media was up there like crazy. That's where they continued to march Oswald back and forth in different <laughs> rooms. Well, Captain Fritz, and he was a very nice man, he did not want to march Marina through the third floor mob of reporters, so he decided he would have her in his office and they would bring the rifle to her instead. Okay, so she didn't have to march past all the media. So when Marina arrived at 7.15 p.m., she was put in, a, in Captain Fritz's office, and they had the rifle delivered to her rather than her have to walk through the third floor. So what was displayed down the third floor? What did the media get a big shot at? The rifle. The rifle. Guys carrying the rifle down over his head, all the way down the third floor, the media for the first time is getting a look at the rifle used to Why shoot the president. Like it's really, it was really, if you if you knew the scene, it was it, a lot of people thought that was kind of showboating. 
but really it was the only way they were going to get that rifle down the hallway. There were so many people you couldn't believe it. I guess you could have covered it up and held it like this, but everybody would know what it was. So they just took it down the hallway. Well, the rifle was shown to Marina, but the problem was, and this isn't a, a, a goof, she didn't know anything about rifles. She just knew her husband had a rifle. She didn't know what kind it was, what it shot. She was very naive to, to arms and weaponry. So he didn't, she couldn't say to him, yeah, that's my husband's rifle. I'm not really sure, to tell you the truth, I don't even know what kind he has. And that was probably true. Because I'll get in this, get in this later, when he bought the rifle, he put it in the storeroom and told her never to go in there. Well, what about the picture she took again? Well, we'll get to that. Okay? Yeah. Just because she took a picture doesn't mean she knows the rifle, but who knows. Now, this is when it gets kind of interesting. When Captain Fritz and the police left the room that they showed Marina the rifle, Oswald's mother, Marguerite, is it on your sheet there? Mm -hmm. Marguerite, Oswald's mother, Marguerite Oswald, suddenly shows up in the room. And who's in the room? Marina and Mrs. Payne. Where's Marguerite from? Well, we'll get into that later, too. So when Captain Fritz and police left the room, Oswald's mother, Marguerite, who was borderline crazy, by the way, <laughs> when you hear, we'll get into this later, because this is such a long story, it, it just, you can't pull one thing for the other. I appreciate your questions, but I'm telling you, it'll get to you, but it's just got to make a sense. She suddenly appears, and here's how weird she was. When she heard about the assassination and heard her son's name mentioned as the possible assassin, she called the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, because they lived in Fort Worth. She called the Fort Worth Star-Telegram and asked them if they would give her a ride down to Dallas Police Headquarters. Just called them, and they said, well, this isn't a taxi service here. What are you talking about? She goes, well, I'm the mother of the accused assassin of the president. As soon as she told them that, they scurried and got a car and drove her right down to Dallas Police Headquarters. Why would they do that? Because they wanted to have the story. So that's what she did. She, what she did, actually did that. She called the, the Fort Worth Star Telegram, which is a newspaper, Fort Worth Star Telegram in Fort Worth, and asked if they'd give her a ride down to Dallas Police Headquarters. And they looked at her like, well, we're not a taxi service here. And she goes, well, I'm the mother of the accused assassin. As soon as she said that, they, were, they picked her up pronto and took her to police headquarters. Now, who else do you think might have arrived at police headquarters? At the same time with his mother. Dad? Father. No father, we'll talk about that. His brother Robert. His brother Robert Oswald showed up as well. Now, this gives you an idea. Robert Oswald was a very nice man. And throughout this whole process and years later, very nice man. Mother crazy. Son, Lee, a little crazy. Anyway. When Lee's brother Robert arrived at police headquarters, Marguerite took him aside and told him, be careful what you say, this room is bugged. And, and, the, and the son, who didn't have a lot of love for his mother, nor did Lee, kind of just said, come on, mother. And she also told Robert that she knew for a fact that Lee was working for the CIA, and whatever he did, he was told to do by them. I mean, she was really off the rocker. So now in that room, you've got poor Marina, who can't speak much English. She's got Ruth Payne, who's thinking, my God, what have I gotten myself into, probably. The mother, who's crazy, and the brother, who's trying to get mom settled down. That's what you're looking at. At 7.40 p.m., the third lineup is scheduled. The third lineup. Now this lineup, this lineup would would provide a special eyewitness, a guy by the name of Howard Brennan. Howard Brennan. He was the eyewitness that was going to identify Oswald this time. What do you think the difference is from our lecture yesterday? On, who do you think Howard Brennan was? He was the guy who saw him at the. Pen. He very good. He was the one that saw him in the sixth floor window. Okay, he's the one I told you about yesterday that we talk about later. So in the third lineup, Howard Brennan will try to pick the man he saw on the sixth floor of the depository making the final third shot 
at the presidential limousine. So, again, four people are brought in. Oswald among the four in the lineup. Brennan states to police he's not sure which man is Oswald. Why would he say that? What? Not necessarily. He got a pretty good look at him. Why did he say he wasn't sure? Because he changed his outfit. No. No. It was really far. He was in the lineup. What? It was far. No? No, he actually got a good shot at him. He's afraid. He doesn't know if there's more than one shooter. And he's afraid if he identifies Oswald, he's afraid for himself and his family. So he was very apprehensive and aloof and would not identify Oswald because he was afraid if he identified Oswald, if there was more than one shooter, the safety of his family would be in jeopardy, which is really a bad break Could for the, the police. Line of people hear him when he's like that? It's that one? No. They can't. Now, at 7.55 p.m., after the third lineup, Oswald is brought back into Fritz's room for more interrogation. They're going to talk to him some more. So at 7.55 p.m., and again, we're still on the 22nd, Oswald is brought back into Fritz's office for more interrogation. She's gone. Yeah. She's left with the nut house of the mother. Oswald has asked more questions, including from Captain Fritz. Did you keep a rifle in Mrs. Payne's garage? No, I don't own a rifle. He's a smart guy, Oswald. Oh, so he didn't own that rifle. Well, he, well that, or remember they asked him before if he owned a rifle, and he said no. Mm -hmm. So he, he, even, he didn't, just, didn't, didn't just say no. He said, no, I don't own a rifle, because he can tell that Fritz is trying to slip him up. See, he's not stupid. Now, Oswald, after he said, no, I don't own a rifle, he was told by Fritz that the people at the house he that his wife lived at said he kept a rifle wrapped in a blanket. So after he says, no, I don't own a rifle, Fritz says, well, you know, the people at the house, your wife and Mrs. Payne, say that you do own a rifle and you wrapped it in a blanket in the garage. His response, that's not true. Fritz, getting a little frustrated with Oswald, but not really showing it, says in a calm manner the big question. He says, quote, Lee, you know you've killed the president, and this is a very serious charge. That's what he says to him. He finally just can't take it anymore. Lee, you know you've killed the president, and this is a very serious charge. Oswald responds by saying, no, I haven't killed the president. When Fritz told him that the president was dead, Oswald's response was, oh, well, forget about him in a day or two, and we'll get a new president. That was his response. So this Oswald is just in denial, or he's, I mean, Fritz thinks maybe he's had some training in interrogation because he's so good at it. He's never had a, a tougher nut to crack when it comes to a confession. Well, who do you think they bring in next to talk to? Think about what we said today. Who? No? Think about what we said. No? No? You're close when you say Ruth. His brother. No? Think about the what the guy that drove him to work. The guy that drove him to work, who I talked to on the phone yesterday, by the way. <laughs> Buell Wesley Frazier was brought to police headquarters. Buell Wesley Frazier was the was the brother of who? Uh, Lenny. Lenny? May, May Randall. Randall. He was the brother. He's the one that gave him a ride to work that day. So Captain Fritz brought in Buell Wesley Frazier. If you come into my office and see that big framed, big framed display with the letter, that's a handwritten note from him. Okay, now, Frazier was a young man who had given Oswald a ride to work that Friday morning, and I want to explain this to you as I have probably before. It was unusual because Oswald's normal procedure from the from the uh, boarding house that he lived in in North Beckley, he normally would walk to work back and forth to work. But on Fridays, he would get a ride with Frazier to Ruth Payne's house, and he would spend the weekend with his daughters and wife, Mrs. Payne let him do that, then he would get a ride back with Frazier on Mondays back to work. He had been doing that for a few weeks. 
Well, this particular thing hit Frazier weird because he asked him for a ride home on Thursday night, which he had never done before. And when Frazier asked him, well, gee, how come you're going home tonight rather than the usual Friday, he responded to Frazier by saying, well, Marina has made me some curtains for my boarding house room, and I'm going to Ruth Payne's to get some curtain rods for the curtains. Frazier didn't think anything of it. Well, why would you? So, anyway... Mrs. Payne returned home that night from shopping and she was very surprised to see Lee and Marina sitting on the lawn playing with the children because he normally didn't come and tell Friday and he really didn't have permission to come and tell because Marina really did, or excuse me, Ruth didn't really like him that well. Marina was very embarrassed and felt awkward that Lee had arrived there unannounced and he, she just didn't feel good about it but you know, Mrs. Payne didn't want to deal with it, so it was fine. But he was came unannounced, and Mrs. Payne wasn't overly thrilled with that. Well, that evening, on Thursday night, the night before the assassination, Mrs. Payne went to her garage to look for some paint to decorate some wooden blocks for her own children. She had some blocks, and she wanted to paint them up. Mrs. Payne did that. She went to her garage looking for some paint to decorate some wooden blocks for her own children. And she noticed the light was on when she went there. And she just assumed that Lee had been in there foraging around, because they did have some stuff in there, and just forgot to turn it off. So she went in Thursday night, the light was on, left on, and she assumed Lee had been in the garage. Keep it in consideration, she doesn't know anything about what? A gun. A gun. Very good. So uh, like when the police showed up and asked her for a gun, was Miss Payne surprised? Yeah. Very surprised. When Marina said, does your husband own a gun? Yes, it's in the garage in a blanket. Ruth Payne about fell over backwards because she was a very big advocate of nonviolence. She would never have allowed a gun in her garage. Anyway, <coughs> Mrs. Payne didn't ask Lee Harvey Oswald about the light or anything because he was already in bed when she got done with her painting project and he left before she got up the next morning. So there never was any discussion, hey Lee, did you leave the light on? Nothing like that. According to Mrs. Payne, Oswald was very quiet that Thursday night at dinner. He went to bed earlier than usual, and again, he left $170 and his wedding ring on a cup on the dresser. He also left a note for Marina that Thursday night to get some new shoes for Junie. That was their daughter, June. So, when Oswald was talked to by Fritz, he asked him to kind of explain what went on that morning, and he said that Oswald had overslept, dressed quickly and hurried down the street towards Frazier's home, knocked on his door about 7, 10 a.m., which was later than usual on that day. And this is what Frazier was later quoted as saying. This is what he told the police. And when I came out to get into the car, I glanced over and saw a package in the back seat. I said, what's that? And he said, Oswald said, you remember, that's the curtain rods I was going to bring. So... Frazier did ask him what was in that package. Now, Frazier's sister said it was about two feet long, right? When, when, when Frazier was questioned about it at the time of the assassination, he said it fit between the armpit of Oswald and his cupped hand. So, you know, this kind of distance here is what he said. Now, the bottom line is the rifle was actually longer than that, but it did disassemble, okay? But even the disassembled length I believe it was 32 inches, so it would have been more than two feet, but maybe would have fit in Oswald's arm. So there's a little controversy there. But anyway, uh, uh, Buell Frazier was, was questioned. Okay, at 10.15 p.m. that night, that's the same night, third? No, no, that's Friday night? Yeah, oh, I kind of went back and forth. But we're still talking about the investigation on the 22nd. At 10.15 p.m. that night, Fritz kind of sits down and thinks to himself, and he lays out the evidence he has against Oswald in the shooting of Kennedy. Okay, so let's think about this a little bit. So again, 
At 10.15, the night of November 22nd, the day of the assassination. Girls, what are you doing? <laughs> are you getting this? Yes. He, he basically lays out the evidence against Oswald. What do I have on Oswald? Not on the shooting of Tippett, but the shooting of Kennedy. Okay, think about this. There is no evidence tying Oswald to the rifle at this point. None. There is no proof that the rifle belonged to Oswald, right? There are no eyewitnesses that put Oswald on the sixth floor of the depository at the time of the shooting because Howard Brennan's kind of gone chicken on him, so to speak. Okay? And they don't have, for sure they don't have, a cooperating suspect. They have no confession. So they don't have much. Fritz was certain he had his guy, and he was right. But he didn't have much, so what did he need badly? A confession, okay? Now, you're thinking to yourself, how long can they talk to this guy? Well, he killed, without doubt, they have enough evidence in what? The tip of murder. So they can hold him without bail. He's not going anywhere, and as long as he's not going anywhere, he has no time limit on how many times they can talk to him. So what Fritz wants badly is a confession, okay? Now, you got to remember, the Dallas the Police Department wants to charge him with Kennedy's murder that day. They want to bad, because they want to show the world that they're not messing around here, that they're going to find the president's assassin. And there's a lot of pressure on Fritz to do that. So finally, even with the lack of evidence they have, at 11.26 p.m., on November 22nd, 1963, they officially charged Oswald in the murder of President John F. Kennedy. 11.36 p.m. Not long before the next day, before midnight. Did you say 26 or 26? I'm sorry, 11.26 p.m., Lee Harvey Oswald was charged in the murder of President John F. Kennedy. Guess who they didn't tell they charged him? Oswald? Didn't tell Oswald. Didn't even tell him they charged him. And make a point on this. Okay? That's what happened November 22nd, 1963, as far as his interrogation. How could they charge him with no circumstances? They just thought, they really thought in their mind they had enough. Even though it doesn't look like they got much. But what are they still hoping for? Confession. And they think they're going to get it. Okay, let's move to Saturday, November 23rd. We'll continue the confession. Do they know, like, they ever find out what his motive was? No, that's, a, that's how we're ending this whole lecture. It's a good one, too. Okay, now remember, we're into Saturday now. At 12.10 a.m., Phoenix. Yes? <laughs> At 12.10 a.m. Okay. At 12.10 a.m. That would be like right in the morning, right? At 12.10 a.m. In the morning. Was Fritz's wife mad that he was at work, please? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> now, who are they getting pressure from to see? The White House. FBI. Right. No. Who are they get? Yeah. The media. The media's been up and down that third floor for ever and a day. They're driving them crazy. Well, because it's tough to do. They're driving them nuts. Shh. So Fritz decides that he's going to take Oswald back to the lineup room and he's going to let the press get pictures of him. Okay? That's, he finally decides you can't beat him, join him, so to speak. So he makes the decision after conferring with some other police officials that they are going to take Oswald back to the lineup room so the press can get pictures of him. And they give the press ground rules that they can take photos, but they can't do what? Shoot him. Ask questions. Ask questions. Okay? Ask questions. So the press is given ground rules that they may take photos, but they cannot ask him any questions. So they walk Oswald into the platform of the room, the holding room, the lineup room, and what does he start doing? Talking. Talking. Just starts talking. Well, the media takes this as their cue that they can ask him questions. They did not expect that. And frankly, Fritz didn't expect him to come up and start blabbing everything off. So he starts visiting about this and telling them about this. And finally, one of the reporters said, quote, Did you kill the president? Right to him. And this is what he said. No, I have not been charged with that. 
In fact, nobody has said that to me yet. The first thing I heard about it was when a newspaper reporter in the hall asked me that question. And at that point, a reporter says, you have been charged. And he got this really disgusted look on his face, and they got him the hell out of there. So it was, they didn't give him much shot. So he walks in this lineup room. Everybody's just taking pictures. He starts talking. That's the media, they think that's their cue to ask a question. The first question they say, and the only question really that you could hear, did you kill the president and his answer? No, I have not been charged with that. And then finally a newspaper reporter says, you have been charged. And he looked at him kind of funny. He said something like, what? And he says, you have been charged. And then they got him out of there. So they were taken. They took him out of the room. And at 12.30 a.m. on the 23rd, they took his mug shot for the first time. That's where you take the front and side shot. They took his mug shot at, for the first time at 12.30 a.m. on Saturday, November 23, 1963. Okay? Now, at 10.10 that morning, same morning, it's 10.10, Who wants to know what the hell is going on in Dallas? John. Lyndon Johnson. And he calls FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover and he says, Hey, how are things going in Dallas? Keeping in mind, that was his home state. His home state and the events that happened in his home state made him President of the United States. So he wants to make sure he has all the details of what's going on and he wants to make sure that this investigation was done by the book. He wants no screw-ups because it's his home state that not only resulted in the assassination but made him president. Now, this is getting to Brandy. As we start to move on, we'll move towards what she said. The police got a huge break the night of the 24th late while Oswald was doing all of his thing and they were charging. They got a late break. They found an order form for the rifle used in the assassination. They found an order form. And that order form came from this magazine, the February 1963 issue of the American Rifleman. Okay? Now, as hard as it might believe, be to believe in those days, you could buy and sell guns in the mail. And there was a lot of ads in these particular... Uh, magazines, and this is a copy of the page of that magazine in which Oswald ordered, well I, I'm going to back up, in which the gun was ordered, and then we'll tell you how it was ordered. See if you can find the rifle. You're going to buy this, you're going to buy yourself a rifle from Klein's Sporting Goods. You see the coupon in the bottom right hand corner? Klein's Sporting Goods, and you're in the mood for a rifle. A lot of these rifles that were for sale, a lot of these rifles that were for sale were old army surplus rifles that came back from the war. Okay, so they found an order form, that one in the bottom right hand corner they found. And it was ordered by A.J. Heidel, the alias that Oswald was using at the time. The rifle was ordered by A.J. Heidel. Actually, A. Heidel is who it was actually ordered by. Same person. Now, he had it delivered to a post office box. Guess who the post office box was being rented by? Heidel. No, there's no Heidel. Oswald. Lee Harvey Oswald. So here's how stupid the guy is. Yeah, he, oh, yeah, he orders the gun under an alias, A. Heidel, which it, when they catch him, he's got both IDs in his pocket, and it's sent to a post office box that's being rented by Lee Harvey Oswald. So they've tied the guy in in two different ways. Now, if you look at that rifle and that ad, you can see the one that he bought, I'm sure. He bought the rifle, including the scope. He paid $19.95 for the rifle that killed the president. You could order it with a scope or without a scope. Brandy, how much was it without a scope? Is that what it says? I don't know. I don't know. You got 
1288, and if you wanted the scope, it was 1995. It was shipped, just you need to know this, it was shipped to Oswald on March 20th, 1963. It was shipped from Klein's Sporting Goods to Oswald's Post Office Box on March 20th. It was shipped COD. You could do that in those days. Anybody know what that means? Collect on delivery. And what you could do in those days is you could order something and not pay any money, and then when it came in, the post office would collect the COD, which was how much? 1995, and that's what happened. Yes, Jacob? On March 20th, it was shipped. On March 20th. And it was sent to Oswald via A. Heidel at Oswald's post office box, COD, with a balance of 1995 upon delivery. Oh. Now, as I mentioned, this is important. Oswald, once he received the rifle, he kept it in a small storeroom at an apartment when he and Marina were together, before they split. Kept it in an apartment in a storeroom. And he told Marina not to go in that storeroom. And she asked him, Gee, Lee, how come you bought that rifle? And he said he intended to use the rifle for hunting and that he'd be taking it out and practicing with it quite a bit in the near future. Did he speak Russian? Yes. Like yeah, pretty good. Yep. We'll talk about that later. Was he really going to use it for hunting or did he already That's have what he told him. Well, that's what well, we're going to get your opinion. He had a plan, but he was going to hunt, but he wasn't hunting. At that time, he wasn't hunting presidents or deer. He was hunting something else, and we'll get into that. Okay, so Marina, when Marina inquired about the rifle, he told her that he intended to use the rifle for hunting, he'd be practicing with it, and to stay out of the storeroom where it was. Okay, at 10.30 a.m., the 23rd, 10.30 a.m., the 23rd, Fritz has new info, doesn't he? So he meets with Oswald. He now has the rifle used in the assassination of President Kennedy tied to the man he has in custody, right? Okay, so he opens up the conversation with Oswald at 10.30 in the morning. He says, how'd you sleep, Lee? Lee replies, never slept better. Cocky son of a gun. Never slept better. So Fritz then says, Fritz asked Oswald about the package he brought to work the day of the assassination. I understand you brought a package to work, yeah? What was in the package? My lunch. Gee whiz, that's a pretty big package. Had a pretty big lunch. And that's just the way it was. That's the way it was. Well, Fritz then said, have you ever ordered a rifle under the name A.J. Heidel? Oswald said, no. He just said no. When he was confronted on the fact that his ID card bore his name of A.J. Heidel, he said he didn't know anything about it. Even though they showed it to him when they brought it out and it had his photo on it. This guy was incredible. What? He said he picked up a new ID? He said he picked the name up. But the photo ID, he acted like he didn't even know that they had had it from when they took it out of his wallet. Very aloof. Now, This is where, where Brandy kind of comes in. Meanwhile, back at the Payne residence, Marina's back there with Ruth, and Marina's feeling kind of bad <coughs> down the dumps, and she's flipping through a scrapbook full of photos with her and Lee and the kids and better times, and she comes across this photo. Of course she has it. It's creepy. She comes across this photo in the scrapbook. How tall is he? Not very big. Now, she doesn't know what to think because think about what Marina's been through. And she kind of even forgot about this photo that she took of her husband at their apartment when they lived together. She doesn't know what to do, so she takes the photos out of the scrapbook, folds them in half, there's two or three of them, and she puts them in her shoe. Puts them in her shoe. These pictures were taken by Marina 
in the backyard of their apartment. And what Oswald's holding there is the rifle, the revolver that he shot Tippett with is strapped to his belt, and a copy of a publication called The Worker and the Militant, which is on your ID sheet. So in that photo that Marina definitely took, Oswald was holding a rifle, the pistol in which he shot Tippett, and a publication called The Worker and the Militant. And we will wait and tell you later. Quick, quickly, I'm not upset, I'm just asking who is not going to be here tomorrow because I want to make plans. Might or, or not? Either one. one. Okay, we'll see how it goes. We'll go from there. Have a great Thanksgiving weekend for those of you that won't be back to enjoy my company. Yeah.